Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming. Um, we're going to start this off with a little slideshow I put together um, about moms. And uh, these people that you are looking at here are Patty's parents. Um, and uh, is there anything you'd like to <laughs> say about this? Or they, they are my parents. That they are <laughs> her parents. Uh, this person here, next slide, which is not, this is not working. Uh, it was working earlier. There's uh, no reason to be anxious. No. We're not anxious people, uh, so it's not a problem. <laughs> this is not working. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> Even that guy can't no, handle it. Yeah, no, my parents. Hey, hey, don't leave. No. <laughs> That's my You're mother on the right, my father on the left. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies, um, coming on stage with a ukulele, does that make you feel like you really nailed it? Because that's what it looks yeah. like to me. Um, uh, there's a, it's really a toy more than a ukulele. Well, that's, ukuleles are yeah. sort of, they're halfway between a toy and an instrument. And we, we got them because they're so cute. Thank you. I mean, okay. now it's I believe, beyond. I can't wait ah, for the okay. Here we are. Uh, this person here is my mother. Um, I kind of, this is an interesting picture because uh, this is my mother. It looks like it was taken in about 1933 and uh, I believe it was. And um, I have a question. Why does her pin say millet? <laughs> she loved millet. millet. I thought so. <laughs> and she really believed that if everybody <laughs> ate millet, it was kind of like, you know about like Graham crackers, yeah. the guy who invented yeah. Graham crackers, that you know, she believed that if everybody ate millet, the world would be a more mm -hmm. peaceful place. Um, and I'm not so sure about the lipstick. It's a little bit like hu hussy-ish, I think. Um, this is uh, this is the very first. This is the reason that we, that Roz and I know each other. This is the first thing that I ever published. It was, I think, in 1784. <laughs> it was uh, it's still uh, relevant. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's still relevant. It was uh, in the Atlantic Monthly Magazine, and um, Roz illustrated it. We were in our early twenties. Yes, and um, my mother. Uh, said, that's a great illustration. You should call the illustrator, which is like a wacky idea. But I'm a follower. So I thought, I don't want to, this is kind of awkward to do. And it was a little like, you know, you're seven, she's seven, go play with each other on the, yes. on, on the playground. Patty's mother set us up on a play date, right. basically. And we're still on the yeah. play date. We're still on the play date, so. yeah. yeah. Um, so I'm going to show some slides from this book. And these were Patty's, I mean, okay, I'm just gonna go through them, then we're gonna talk about the book. Humming, these are things that Patty's mother over the years has said. And, and, that's humming, the, and the whole book is a collection of things that yes. over the years Patty's mother yes. said. Yes. Mm -hmm. And it's not, I mean, every one of our mothers says something funny, but your mother is saying things that truly could be considered tr like, like catchphrases. Yeah, bon well, mots, whatever you, like, your mother is really nailing it and sort of crystallizing it in a pretty profound way. And she's uh, hilarious. Yeah. I mean, she's humming funny. is hostile. I mean, what could and be more true, true? right? Yeah. True. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. You know, you've been with your <laughs> maid or whoever. <laughs> What's wrong? We're fine. Oh, nothing. Yeah. <laughs> Can't talk now, I'm humming. <laughs> Uh, well, it's also so horrible the idea that someone would be so um, kind of frustrated in your company that they would need to sing to distract I know, themselves. I know, because there's yeah. not a radio around, so they can't do that. Yeah, it's yeah. like we don't have any way to occupy our time. It's like, I'm standing yeah. here, sir. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, this is also never serve salmon when entertaining. It is boring. Yeah, and you uh, like being boring. Yeah, no, the, your mother was very, uh, well, who likes being bored? But like, I never thought of like salmon as something that Well, here's the thing, salmon is boring, but what is wrong with boring when it comes to fish? That's true, that's true. Do you want your fish to be really <laughs> exciting? I would it's argue like, that in addition to humming being hostile, it's hostile to serve fish when people come over. Oh, yeah. yeah. I think you it's should. The, and smug. Yeah, it's also yeah. like, it's making the assumption that everyone has your slightly perverse tastes. Mm -hmm. And you know what's best for them, they, yeah. yeah. Oh my God, people telling me to eat fish, like, because I have health stuff, people are always like, are you eating fish a few times a week? And I'm like, is it an acceptable answer to say I fucking hate it? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I would say so. Uh, nature, if seen at all, is best seen from a car. 
And I know, I mean, who does not agree right. with that? And, and perhaps not even a car, maybe a, a, pho a photograph. A photograph, that's oh, even yeah. better. My friend Ingrid, who's in the audience here, we were um, looking through her online dating profile, and there was a guy who said that, like, he was like, I love to go outdoors and be with people. Come out here with me. And we were lying in bed, and we just, and we just start to laugh hysterically. Like, yes. the well, idea that you would come out there with somebody. Do you know what is the worst? Like, when you're with somebody, and you're going to a restaurant, and they spy a patio, and then they say, <gasps> That's the worst. That, that, let's eat outside. With the, with the bugs and the wind. It's the stupidest And so people thing. can yeah. see us eat. Oh, yeah, I can't wait to be out here with bugs. Yeah. It's just a Also, snakes. have two people ever looked more adorable being totally negative? <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. a joy. Like, I'm realizing that you guys are these tiny little imps, and you can sort of, like, complain about the general state of the world, and it's really cute, and then I join you, and it's different. Yeah. No. no. It's funny. It's just no, so no, no. hard to say nice things. Yeah, it is. Get away with it. I don't, I don't consider it complaining. I think we're just sort of stating the truth. Analysis. Yeah. Yep. You know, analysis. It's a kind of like week in review. Yeah. Well, yeah. well, actually, my mother called criticism constructive analysis. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, <laughs> um, girls named Susan are full of confidence. True. Some of the things no that Patty's why. mother said are very strange. I mean, but it's but this does. The more I think it's about true. it, it's true. I've never met like I've never met a Susan who wasn't pretty high on her own supply. That's I, I like that high on her own supply. That's good. It's good very one. very good. Uh, um, if you're writing it, see this boring thing. If you're writing a novel, I'll tell you what to do. Don't make it boring. Um, and uh, we have The Old Man in the Pond, uh, 1994. I love Seinfeld. Oh, me too. Um, and Grapes of Annoyance. And so, um, and I love this one. Never wear red and black together or you will look like a drum majorette. She's 100% right. Isn't that yeah. true? I read it and I was like, oh, completely got it. Yeah. I'm not going to try that again. Understand why it hasn't worked. Absolutely. There were so many things in this book like yeah. that. Of course, but we're going on tour tomorrow. I've done nothing for the entire month but pack, repack, pack, repack, repack, repack. And I do have a red and black outfit I particularly like, but so get ready for the drum, for the band <laughs> and back up. <laughs> well, did you pack the hat? Yeah, of course. Oh, good, good, good. Yeah. Um, you don't need to spend a lot of time in San Francisco. It's all frosting and no cake. And what we realized <laughs> we last realized night, wait, 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 we're going on this tour, the only place we're staying two nights, or so we think, is San Francisco. Yeah. <laughs> They're going to get a kick out of that. Oh, I'm sure they'll be laughing away. Yeah. It's uh, like the one time I spoke to some people at Hallmark Cards, and I was uh, telling them my favorite genre of, of greeting card. And it's those those cards in the supermarket that like are they're like trifold and they're they always have like a kind of weird watercolor kind of insipid picture in the background and then there's like a fake handwriting font where the person is basically just trying to say I screwed up I'm sorry but then they have to say a poem mm -hmm. and it's like the water under the bridge and sometimes the water is over the bridge and I was explaining this and laughing and uh -huh. nobody in the room was laughing. <laughs> Um, so yeah, it's um, like have you ever, have you ever started to tell somebody gossip and realized you're telling them gossip about themselves? One hundred percent. Someone recently sent me. They were like trying to inform me. Yes, I completely understand what was frustrating about living with your ex. I just had this argument with him, and can you believe this? And they wanted to show me their funny retort and sent me a screen cap that was him basically just like giving a, a description of his new life and it was too close to the breakup for that to have happened. That was a bad thing. And she, the person who did it was anxious once they figured it out mm -hmm. and I thought it was so funny. Well, it is pretty, yeah. <laughs> And it's also nice to have somebody sort of squirming in the, squirming, squirming that like that. really fun to yes. watch. They owe you, yes. they owe you uh, something. Uh, so that. often it's us that are doing <laughs> the squirming. <laughs> this is true. Um, if you run out of food at a dinner party, the world will end. <laughs> and uh, there's these two aliens. And what happened over there in Quadrant 63? <laughs> Mrs. Proskoff ran out of brisket. 
two minutes ago. <laughs> um, so, uh, but don't go overboard or your table will look like a Las Vegas buffet. This is one of my favorites because it is truly like the, the real um, expertise of a Jewish mother is to get exactly the right amount of food so that it's like yes. laid out in a way that's appealing and isn't yes. you know, going to leave repulsive leftovers but also seems to go on forever. I think my mother no, has like, yes. here is the storage unit of our, of our groceries. I remember oh. my mom shopped I just remembered how much my mom shopped for Y2K oh, and oh, God. how full our like how full our pantry was for like a full two years and how we were eating the Y2K pasta for just <laughs> eternity afterwards. Um, this also this drawing is so great and the meal looks so appealing, including there's some kind of like vegetable gelatin in there. Yeah. Yes, there's yeah. also salmon. There's yeah, yes. yeah. <laughs> two kinds. Well, my, mo my mother used to do this thing when she would have people over for dinner. She would constantly remember there was one more thing in the refrigerator she'd have to bring out. <laughs> and so the table always did look like this. It would be like the gefilte fish and the this and the that. And it would just, and the tables didn't fit together right because we, we lived in an apartment. So there was like a bridge table on the end of the table. It was really, <laughs> it, was, it was actually kind of like a very interesting look, kind of like, <laughs> a, like a yard sale, kind of. <laughs> uh, um, redheads are extroverts. This is also the way you chose to draw an extrovert, which yeah, is just great? like <laughs> thyroid problem, right. eyes popping out of head. No neck. <laughs> <laughs> well, the neck is kind of behind the head. Oh, yeah. It's like stretched out so far, I think. That, that's what an extrovert Right. Is. I know I haven't <laughs> ever met like a, shot, a retiring redhead. And choosing to be a redhead is its own thing, because that's just like being like, what should I wear today? A shirt or a neon sign? Yes. <laughs> yes. This is, yeah. Extroverts are, I, I never want to hear anybody referred to as a force of nature. I always think that's, you know, trouble ahoy. <laughs> <laughs> um, Mike says, you can only get a Dalma Dalmatian if the spots are symmetrical. Also, I will say, Mike didn't just say that. He returned to Dalmatian. <laughs> <laughs> Who is Mike? Mike is my parents' friends. Um, Mike was married to Mike. They were the Mikes. And this Mike <laughs> is an antique dealer. Love. So your, your parents. Very, very good at arranging furniture if you need that. So your parents were friends with homosexuals. They were. Love. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. I just love how, like, Mike. Mr. It's and like Mrs. God. Mike. Heaven. Yeah. Uh, Oh, okay, so now I'm going to just show a Not few a cards. Not a lot of them. But enough. My <laughs> grandmother had homosexual friends and referred to them as the bachelors. <laughs> the bachelors. Oh, well, this is the great thing. My mother had a friend, and her brother was gay, but they didn't know what gay was. They didn't really know what anything was. But they, on some level, they must have known because they said, they were in college, they said, Steve is European. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. It's kind of like, well, I don't know. I hope this is not like a bad, oh, I'm ready. I'm like, I've got, got like, you know, one foot in already. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, when my daughter was about five years old, we were in this grocery store. <gasps> and um, <laughs> um, it's a grand union in our neighborhood. And there was a, um, a little person. Um, stocking some groceries and she was so sort of surprised she knew that this wasn't a child but she'd never seen a little person before and she asked me mommy is he from france <laughs> and i have no idea why i, t I tell that story a little differently of course <laughs> <laughs> oh feel, feel free to vary it <laughs> um, this is this is uh, i'm just going to show a few two or three like New Yorker cartoons that are, have to do with mothers. This is Mother's Day. Uh, she's looking at greeting cards. Bitter, pitying, ironic, guilt-inducing, and pro forma. <laughs> I'll um, take a dozen of each. This is mom's mortuary. He never should have divorced his first wife. She was a floozy, and this is what happens to floozies. Um, he pushed himself too hard. Uh, she was never the same after that crackpot diet. Um, <laughs> He moved to Florida, and boom, five minutes later, he was dead. <laughs> uh, and this cartoon, um, this, uh, when moms dance, uh, uh, 
a lot of times people ask me, where, you, where do you get your ideas for cartoons? And I, I really generally don't know, but this one did come from life. When my daughter was around 16, she was doing her homework in the living room, and uh, she, was, she was listening to some hip hop music on the boombox. And if you have ever been a teenager or have had teenagers, you know that there's nothing more disgusting than the sight of an adult human body, especially if that adult human body is doing some sort of like gyration. <laughs> and uh, anyway, so I just kind of wanted to see if she was paying attention to me <laughs> and um, to yank her chain a little bit. And so I kind of came into the living room and kind of did this little sort of dance and she actually looked up and she said, Mom, stop, you're hurting me. <laughs> <laughs> and it was so funny that uh, I asked her if I could use it as a cartoon. So anyway, um, I, this, For is, the this next con portion of concludes the, <laughs> the slides. And now we are onto the conversation. Well, it's a true honor to be sitting here with both of you. You're, both of you have influenced me in ways that I can't even describe. The audience is full of your fans. This book is a joy and it's the first book I've ever met that's that it's the first book I've ever found that is smart but would also make a really adorable Mother's Day gift. Thank you. And, and that's a Venn. that's a Venn diagram that's hard to <laughs> occupy. So there's a congratulations in that alone and and you know I've gotten to spend time with you before Patty mm -hmm. to dinner where we you know ate our chicken slowly and stared into each other's eyes. And I also have been your fan from afar, but this is my first time. I've sat with your work a lot, my first time sitting with you. But I do know from reading your stories and from talking to you that you both have incredibly dynamic, omnipresent, intense, and um, uh, iconic mothers. And so do you. I do. So and. Do you. I do, and I think I grew up thinking that that's just what it meant to have a mom. And it wasn't until I became, got Did older. Did you think you had the worst or the best mother? I thought she was Madonna. Okay. I thought wow. I wanted to watch her get dressed. I wanted to smell her pillows. I wanted to follow her around. I was like about 13 when it occurred to me that she was hot trash. <laughs> and but even then I still thought she was beautiful and chic and glamorous and if she and that the problem was just that like she wasn't um, directing her attention at me properly like there was like <laughs> I always was just like I want the most attention all the time in the exact way you want it but I never had those kinds of thoughts I hear from certain people like I wish I had a regular mom who made soup or something like I was completely obsessed with her and everything that she did and I talk about her all the time, and this is her name tattooed on my middle finger, which really <laughs> says something. <laughs> but what did you think, did best or worst, both of you? Well, I, I had, I, I have, I wish I had a worse childhood than I did. I had a pretty good childhood. I have nothing to complain about. I have to kind of dig deep for material. And yet, and I had no bedtime, and I'd had, um, I could eat or not eat anything I wanted, so there, we had no rules. And yet, I somehow thought my mother was a witch. Literally. <laughs> Literally, I thought one night I saw her flying on a broomstick. And then, you get older, and you think, wow, my family isn't fucked up at all. Look at these really fucked. I mean, you, you meet people and realize how boring and average you are. I mean, for me. I feel like I had the opposite experience, which is that I grew up thinking that we had like a kind of per idyllic and perfect family. And once I learned about the concept of codependence, it was shattered. <laughs> and see, I stand alone here. You also yeah. thought. I, well, I didn't think my mother was a witch. I don't think I had that many things to, I, I, well, basically my parents locked me in a Skinner box. <laughs> so um, I didn't really know that much about other people's parents. I, I was really, I was kind of like, uh, my, my parents both worked. Um, they would leave very early in the morning. They left me with what my mother used to call the maids who did not speak English. So I had a very weird childhood in a way, and then they would come home late, and I was, and the, and I wasn't really 
you know, my parents didn't like it when I played with other little kids. So um, I spent a lot of my childhood sort of by myself, not being able to observe other people's mothers. So I didn't have much to compare my mother to, but I knew from a pretty early age that I was terrified of her. Uh, and that she, I didn't picture her as a witch. I sort of knew in some ways that if she wasn't a witch, she was something I wanted to sort of stay uh, on her good side. Um, she, was a, she was a very formidable person. She was a, a, an assistant principal and very, very, very strong-willed. Um, so that might tell you all you need to know. About I remember that. wishing I had like a like a mushier mother. Like my mom's an artist. She was really kind of like, she was very um, focused on trying to like blaze a trail in a very male dominated field. She was also the way that artists are, dreamy and moody and engaged. And she wasn't a hippy dippy artist. She was like a, you know, dark and forceful artist. And so I wanted, I wanted her all the time. And I had a friend um, in like fourth grade. We lived in Soho in a loft building with no certificate of occupancy. And this person lived in a doorman building on 14th Street, like a post-war doorman building with her parents. And they, I thought they had the best life in the world because they had a doorman, a leather sofa, mm. which to me was just like. Did they have a trampoline? <laughs> That's what I It's wanted. an amazing question. Doorman, leather sofa, wall-to-wall -wall carpeting. So I was like, that's where I want to spend my time. And I would constantly complain to my mom, her mother makes hamburgers. Her mother makes lemonade. Her mother sits with us while we do our homework. Her mother's adorable and blonde and perfect. And then one night I was sleeping over, I'll never forget, and I got up to go pee like maybe at two in the morning and I saw a light on in the kitchen and I looked in and her mother was leaning over the sink, smoking a cigarette and crying. And I stood there for a second frozen. And then the next morning I said, I didn't know your mom smokes. And my friend went, what are you talking about? My mom doesn't smoke. And I was like, oh. Because you better believe, like, if my mom was smoking, I knew. I knew it was like a twice a month thing. Like, the, the transparency, I now think, is actually very cozy. And there seems like there was a lot of transparency in your family. Your mom certainly talks a lot. Oh, no, no, no. We, we, no there was no um, making it nice. You, you just said exactly what you believe, which I thought was a real relief. Um, my mother would call up and say, I read your piece, and, I go, mm -hmm. she goes, and guess what? I hated it. <laughs> but if enough people like it, I'll change my mind. That's one of my favorite okay. lines in the book. I love favorite. that kind of thing. Yeah. What did, how did both of your mothers, this book is a celebration of your mother as much as it is sort of a... It's a celebration of your mother, and I think it's also an analysis of what it feels like to be a person who's like living with the constant withering critique of the one person in the world who's supposed to love them no matter what. And your mom does love you no matter what, but it's that strange dichotomy of like a person who loves you no matter what and will also brutalize you in ways that nobody else will. But, but it was, it was, a, it was fleeting. You know, it was not. I would say my father, if he got annoyed with you, he would remember. Yeah. My mother would say something and then. You know, and then that was over. So you got used to that. I also thought she was right, which was good and bad, because you, you do grow up then thinking that there's a wrong answer. Well, how did your mothers respond to your respective careers? I think my mother, she was proud. Uh, I know my parents were both very proud, because they subscribed to The New Yorker, and their friends <laughs> told them that it was a good thing. Um, <laughs> I think that they were a little weirded out because they knew nothing about, you know, being an artist uh, for your career. They only knew the school system. My father was a teacher also. And I remember one time when I was growing up, you know, like on Johnny Carson when there'd be these signs like, you know, I'm sorry to I'm keep holding this, waving yeah, it around. No, I'm going to put it on the floor. Um, that is ridiculous. Anyway. Um, so on Johnny Carson, like somebody would hold up like back in five minutes and they'd be like hand lettered. My father said, maybe you could do that. <laughs> <laughs> I had that job, sort of. My first, one of my first, first jobs was on Joy Behar's show. It wasn't really quite that, but, and it was the easiest job I ever had. All I had to do was write, you saw him on Letterman, you loved him there, you're going to love him here. Please welcome. And it took me two minutes, and it was so easy that there was a bet in the office that it, 
Patty Marks was not a real person. Joy Behar had just invented that to get more money. <laughs> That's really funny. It was a great yeah. Job. No, they had no they had no idea what this was. I think that they thought I was going to be a teacher. I think that was their. Uh, my I I my parents wanted me be a doctor, marry a doctor, have a doctor. <laughs> and when that didn't work out, uh, they adjusted quite well. I, it was unnerving a little, because I'd go home to Philadelphia, and none of my parents' friends would ask me what to do, uh, what to do, what I was doing, working on, because they all knew. They'd gotten the clippings and the, you know, the bulletins and everything. Yeah, yeah, my parents were, they would, they, they were ahead of their time in social, they invented yeah, they social media own, before. Yeah, they did, they, they invented social so media. So had you two, before you undertook this book, was quoting Patty's mom a regular activity in your relationship? I think I had heard from you so yeah. many of these wonderful quotes that were like, they were this combination of hilarious, ridiculous, true, wonderful, and in some deep way, I also saw and them ridiculous. as- And ridiculous. <laughs> and ridiculous. And I saw them as illustrations. And I told Patty, you know, do you think that maybe if you have like 50 of these, we can make a book? You know? So it was your idea? Yes, it was. It was yeah. Wow. And were there any that couldn't make the book because they weren't politically correct? Hmm, that's a good I question. I think there might have been. My mom I, got mad because my mom made a rule. I'm not allowed to tweet things she says anymore. And anytime she says something, mm -hmm. Now, and I laugh, she goes, don't tweet it. And then, or don't tweet me. But the funny thing is now, sometimes she'll say something and then she'll find herself funny and she'll be like, don't tweet me. And I'm like, I was never gonna tweet you. That wasn't <laughs> interesting at all. But my mom got upset because she said that anyone who has a Keurig coffee machine voted for Trump. And I tweeted it. That's and bullshit. She, yeah, that's Do you like Keurig? I had one, and then I decided I didn't like it because the coffee sucked. I but I, I, I think that's her point. She's like, what are you even? She's like, anyone who has and likes a Keurig coffee machine. When I first had it, I loved I it. I thought people liked I it. I was in love with it I when I it was on the good it. side. That's, that's no, so she's, weird. She's, she Thank hates God a Keurig. You disabused me of that. That's well, she, hates, she God, says I no one like would. It she anymore. says it's an espresso, is what. Uh, Oh, we should divide. We should all get together no, and divide the world. No, an expensive. As That's very elitist. What? I mean, she never well, claimed to be elitist, anything else. Yeah, come on. No, <laughs> all it's of our. Also, very bougie, I think. Right. Yeah. Whereas a cur. I mean, I don't know. I only started drinking coffee like six months ago. This entire thing is. Yeah, I don't drink coffee, so I don't know. This entire thing's alien to me. But she got upset because she wants me not to. You know what you need to do? You gotta get. You gotta make your own plastic holder, or not plastic, out of wood, or like some. It's recycle out of like straws, like recyclable straws. Make a coffee filter thing, and then like a mug that like you found That's like what making Biden, the trash. That's what Biden voters do. And then you like grind your own coffee beans that you went to South America to buy, and and then that'll be like the most politically correct coffee you could possibly, the most virtue signaling okay, yeah. cup of coffee. Well, I wondered if there were things that your mother had said that didn't make there the book. There were. Are my editors here? There was a couple, I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sure. Because we always do things that some, then we look at them later and say, well, how did we even? Oh my God. Yeah, yeah. We did, we a, just we did a children's book. No, yes. we did a children's book. <laughs> oh man. Oh, we can't even say <laughs> this it. This is but worse than We it. would have been shot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We would have really been and we didn't, And we didn't even realize it. We've been like, we would have been like killed like very, yeah, we can't, more, more than once. And you. you never, you never have put it out. So this is unreleased material. Yeah, we'll yeah. whisper it to you later. Yeah. We'll whisper yeah. it to everybody later. Yeah. I'm yeah. so, I know, yeah. we're being live streamed. This I used to say things like, you know, like, just fuck it. But actually, it's not worth it. Yeah. Yeah. But the, the, no. the fleeting joy of saying something deliciously inappropriate is not worth the hours of misery. And I want you to, to not be in trouble until you get to San Francisco. Right. It's yeah, funny yeah. because yeah. I didn't yeah. understand for so long. I thought like, no one really cares that much about where they live. It's not a person. It's not your grandma. It, so it's like, so I've said, I've said mean things about Detroit. I've said mean things about Tampa. People get really upset. Oh yeah, they love where they live. <laughs> Actually, I I did do a slide well, a slideshow in Texas, and I had a joke about um, uh, 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 giant hair, 
And, uh, and I didn't realize um, until I was in the middle of the slideshow and that slide came up that like, I really probably should have taken it out. But that was embarrassing. <laughs> that was bad. And did anyone say like, hey, this is Texas, hey, calm down and do not say anything much negative about giant hair. It was a little hair. bit like the Hallmark thing. It was like, oh, this is a funny, no, it's not. <laughs> I would have bought every Hallmark card you made. It would have yeah. been such a pure pleasure. <laughs> well, hmm, yeah. So, you know, mothers are incredible and amusing and protective and all the good things, but there's also a kind of pain and misery one can have around the issue of their mother around the empty space of their mother that is unlike anything else. So was there any part, like this book is delightful and delectable and a pleasure, but were you guys in any way working through your mom shit as you did this together? Uh, no, we weren't Not working. consciously, but then I'm, I'm never aware of anything anyway. Um. <laughs> what if you guys were just like, we don't have any mom shit, it's exactly, it's perf we were perfect mothers, we had perfect mothers. No. Yeah. Yeah. Or I didn't really have a mother, I don't know how I got here. <laughs> <laughs> we rented, the we rented mothers for the book. <laughs> it's really, yeah, no, it's, it's a true delight to read and I'm very excited to hear from the audience because moms are such a um, rich topic. I'll tell you, the other day my mom called me and she said, um, she said, I can't talk, I'm doing a brunch. And I said, okay, well, you called me. And <laughs> then she goes, I said, who are you having? And she said, well, you know your aunt just bought a house and she cut down about 100 trees. And then my friend Chris, he and his boyfriend cut down all these trees. And I just figured anyone who would cut down 100 perfectly good trees, should, they should meet each other. <laughs> <laughs> and drink Keurig coffee. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. <laughs> okay. That was a great question, but it was a little serious. Mm. Um, <laughs> up your game, kids. Um, okay, great. Did your mother ever sit you down for a sex talk? Oh no, we never ever did. We didn't have sex in our in our family. It was really? pre-sex. You you had more sex in your family. We didn't. We did not have. Sex. My my mother actually in sixth grade. Uh, I don't know if they still do this, but in my grade school, in sixth grade they had an assembly for the boys and an assembly for the girls, where a, a speaker was going to come and uh, and you had to go with your mother. The girls had to go with their mother. The boys had to go with their father, and a speaker was going to come and talk to. Uh, the kids about like their changing bodies and that kind of thing and um, uh, the speaker for the girls didn't show up and so the teachers knew that my mother was extremely authoritative and asked my mother to give the talk which she did which I found incredibly excruciatingly embarrassing um, and uh, even I do listening yeah, to it. Yeah, yeah, it was it was really bad. Um, but no, my mother, you know, she just gave me like one really uh, important piece of advice I think when I was growing up, uh, which was that um, uh, you know I'll share this with you because I don't know if you know you guys know about this um, that girls don't have a physical need for sex, but boys do, and girls are kind of we're like receptacles, kind of like yeah. a cup holder. Yeah. 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 Well, you know? duh. Duh. I know. I know. So I just thought I would share that yeah. important, you know, piece of information with you guys. Just so everybody feels more normal. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. It's a really important thing to tell like a 13-year-old girl. I'll no, we had nothing. I mean, at some point, maybe in my 30s or 40s, I think my mother said. Don't you know anyone who would marry you? <laughs> now, here's a question from me. You have children. You do not have children. So you both have, but you know, are a mother to a billion things and are actually- I'm not a... tall enough to have children. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're a, you know, as a, you're, you're a childless icon. You're an icon with a child. It's great to be a woman all the different ways. Did you receive pressure from your mom around being a mother yourself, and what was their response to being or not being a grandma? Um, I didn't receive that much overt pressure to have children. I think because um, in my family, my mother had a baby before me that died about 12 years before me, and it was a horrible, horrible, horrible experience for her, not just that the baby died, that she almost died as well. 
Um, and I wrote a little bit about this in my book. And, and uh, I didn't find out till I was much older, and I think that really informed a lot of, you know, why my parents were so, especially my mother was so protective of me because she didn't want like a second, you know, screw up on her hands. Um, and she did blame herself. Uh, actually, she sort of blamed my father. The story was that um, because my father had so many anxieties and paranoias, he could not change a light bulb. Um, and, uh, or climb on a ladder, and, he, they, and my mother, uh, when she was pregnant, climbed this ladder and was changing this light bulb, and while she was doing it, she started to hemorrhage, and she almost died, and blah, 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 blah. So, um, we're, uh, so anyway, when I first told her with my first kid that, um, that I was pregnant and um, that my husband and I were gonna have a baby, I still remember this, I was visiting them and having dinner at their apartment, and my mother was, uh, bringing out the coffee at the end of the meal, and she goes, uh-huh, and then just kind of <laughs> kept going. <laughs> and it was just like, you know, I just told you I'm going to have a baby. But that was her reaction, I think, that they were both, it terrified them that I, that I might have to go through this, you know, horrible experience. Um, so that was their reaction. They were not, uh, I don't, I think that being a grandparent was sort of secondary to these, you know, complete fears, you know, terror of you know, all the other medical stuff. Yeah. Uh, I didn't get pressure until you know, it was too late really. Um, <laughs> it wasn't really, um, because everybody, uh, including m me most of all, considers me to be a child. I mean, really, if somebody <laughs> said to me, mom, I'd probably go, don't you ever say that again. <laughs> <laughs> I don't really like responsibility. But, um, and I, I can't say that much because I, have family in the audience, but um, I, my brother has kids. You know, as like Jesus, he suffered for everybody. He has the kids for the family, for my parents. But um, and in their will, and my brother and his wife's will, I think um, her sister was going to get the kids. And my mother was so upset when she found out that I wasn't getting the kids. She goes, "I've already gotten over that they're going to die." <laughs> I'm just so mad. <laughs> Do you feel yourselves becoming your mothers? I'd shoot myself. <laughs> no, I think I'm becoming my father, actually. I, I, well, my mother's pretty old now. She's 92, and I really don't like, I was hoping to get younger and younger and younger. And it's kind of like when you're, when you're, Parents get old and you see what you might have, you know, you might yeah. get, you know, and there's like nothing you can do about it. Um, you think, is it too late to get adopted? <laughs> is it like it to be a surprise what happens to me? <laughs> That's amazing. And it's also really amazing to watch you both talk about your mothers in a way that's clear-eyed and specific and precise, but doesn't involve a lot of blame and is funny. Blame. We forgot to blame. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I that was. That was an blame. oversight. God. <laughs> Ross and Patty, yeah. what makes your relationship work? We agree about everything. That helps. Pretty yeah. much. Yeah, that's great. Uh -huh. um, yeah. No, we do uh, have the same taste. In, I mean, if you tell me a book's good, I know I will like it. And same with art. Yes, and we, movies, but not shoes. We have not shoes. We have opposite shoes. Tastes. But I like it because you're you're in the two kind of most important footwear areas, which is like a, you know, that's a very serious Oxford you've got yes. on, and this is a lot of flirty fun. I'm serious, yeah, yeah. Yes, it covers both bases. Um, yeah. yeah. What else? We we agree, and um, we agree. But also, people. collaborating is really easy. Like, yes. you know, it's. And this is essential when you collaborate with people, and I collaborate with other people. Is like you have to be able to say, "I don't like that idea," yeah, and not and not take it personally, and just move on. And yeah, and we can do that. Yeah, but because we really, like you just want the idea. project to be good. Yeah, you know. And now, in keeping with eulogies, what should your mother's epitaph be? Oh, that's a hard one. Do you have one for your mother? <sighs> hmm, <laughs> a little late, but. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, well, my aunt once told me, your mother thinks she's always right, and she usually is. Um, I don't know. For some reason, it popped into my head, which is not 
in answer to your question, is my mother told me, because she hated not just boredom, but she hated everything made her anxious. And she told me she read the last line of a book or the last page of a, a book first, so she knew what she was in for. She didn't like impending doom. <laughs> That's the best. I used to read the last sentence of a book and then I realized that you were really cheating yourself out of some extreme pleasure. Um, Lena, that's me, I think. Um, uh, I understand you are painting now. Roz, do you have any tips? <laughs> if you find an art supply that you really like, buy a shit ton of it because <laughs> we bought you know, two of these. Yes, we did because they're going to stop making it. And we know they are sad, and then you're going to be spending half your life on eBay, right? Like, or you're going to have to. That's, gonna, has there been an art supply where you've had to start going to eBay and push? Yeah. Well, I'm not. You know, you're not going to share it with the group. No. Is it something that's no, no. no. Well, yeah, I've, I think I've found my medium, which is watercolor That's and so hard. Gonna, water, say watercolor is hard. I don't know. It's, watercolor is kind of nice because it's like well, you just kind of smear it around. My, my father painted, and he gave up. Um, he said because my mother wouldn't let him paint her naked. But the real reason is the day my mother said she would not clean his brushes anymore. Well, oh, Painting wasn't like, worth I'm not going to do that. Yeah, yeah of course. I'm an that's, artist. That's the good thing about watercolor. You don't yeah, really have to clean, true. you know. No, you get but I keep, I keep <laughs> leaving <laughs> cups of watercolor water around the house and then taking big glugs of it. That's a huge problem that I have. Yeah, yeah. I've been drinking also, a lot of paint lately. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Blue would well, seem so delicious. Oh, yeah, no, like that's blue Gatorade is my passion, but that's an entire other panel that I'm sure the 92Y will let us come back and do. I have so Definitely. many times put my brush in my coffee, and then I just go, mm. You know, you keep it fast. The idea of watching the two of you, being a fly on the wall with the two of you work is a dream, which brings me to, do you ladies have a song for us? We do, but we should say, because we, we want you to be not in the song, but, but Roz and I are extremely successful ukulele band. Yes. So famous that you've never heard of us. Yes. And we're called the Ucular Meltdown, and we are... <laughs> Yeah, oh, and we were we, famous in the 60s. Yeah, we, we were called the Daily Pukuleles then. Yeah, And yes. then we became the Weekly, and then the Monthly, monthly and then the yeah. Never Pukuleles. Yeah. And we're, our, our director is in the audience, Martha. The band we're doing is webisodes. director? Oh, you're doing we're webisodes. We're doing webisodes, yeah. and you're going to be in one. I'm actually wait. living for it. It's yes. truly a passion of mine. Also, do you have kind of cool tool on the end of your uke? Like this is because Roz is musical and I'm not. You have to have one of each in the band. Yes, and we believe in that. Yeah. Otherwise it's boring. Yeah, I should like, like, spoiler alert, I don't know how to sing. Um, so this helps me tune. It's amazing. Oh, amazing. You've got a little tuner look, on there. Look, you see, when it's in the... That oh, God, that's really cool. Really good. So it like but you do it by sharp. your ear. No, yeah. it's not. It's not? It's flat? It's a dream, guys. You're here, your history's being made. There you go, that's perfect. Yeah, well, I didn't change it, okay. Um, okay, so we have a, a song about mothers. Okay. We, our specialty is um, public domain songs. Yes. We rewrite it. <laughs> and the reason we broke up in the 60s or 70s is we, we played uh, Hang On Sloopy and we were sued for millions yeah. and millions of dollars. Oh. Yeah, it was horrible, it was horrible. Okay. Okay. On your mark, get set, go. As, As I, I do, do your laundry, laundry Though you're 22 Remember that I'll always Be the boss of you Did I mention starting now you're grounded? Cause all your pot, I, I found it. P.S. I love you. You, 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 you. Must I say it yet again to you, dear? Until the day I die, dear. Put down your damn phone. Phone, phone, phone. Elbows off the table. Mouth shut when you chew. 
Remember that one day soon you'll have kids like you. Never leave the house in that whatever. Eat all your peas forever. P.S. I love you. You, you, you. I think we should do an encore. <laughs> okay, okay. Okay, all right. Uh, and this is uh, a short song that um, would be what it would be like to uh, have your mother in the car while you're driving. <laughs> <laughs> okay. One, or on your mark, get set, go. Park, park, park your car, kinda near the curb. Ay, 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 you just bumped into Herb. <laughs> Before we call it a night, at the very motherly hour of 8.30, do you guys have a final piece of parting advice for the audience? No, we don't have any advice. Yeah. We just ran out of advice. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, there's actually two pieces of advice that my father told me. Oh, yeah. That uh, one is, and of course this was a while ago. If you're running for the subway, you always have a token in your hand. Of course, now it would be a metro card. And the other was, don't neglect your teeth. That's a, that's a good one. It's a good one. That is such a good one. There's only two pieces of advice. That's my father. I gave just me got a one charcoal toothbrush, and I'm not going to lie, I'm loving it. So. What does that mean? It's like got it's like charcoal infused. Now that I'm saying it, it's incredibly stupid. I wish it I'd never mentioned it. It's like charcoal. No, it's like. Can you like grill on it? There's like char. <laughs> there's like charcoal oh. in the bristles. It's so dumb. I don't know why. Sounds I would. like an art supply. Yeah. It does sound like an art supply. It's a toothbrush. It's an art supply. Yeah. But it's never true. neglect your teeth. Never That's neglect good. your teeth. My father gave me one bit of advice. We were driving down the street in Philadelphia. And my father could be a little sentimental, unlike my mother. And he said, you know, before I died, I thought, oh, of course. I want to tell you something. Never park in that garage. It's a <laughs> ripoff. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Patricia Marks, Roz Jass, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.